most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one who calms the storms in our lives, that you are the one who reaches out to us to save us. May our eyes be open to see your hand at work about us, our ears be open to hear your word, our hearts be open to receive and embrace it. Come, Holy Spirit, take over this service and kindle in us the fire of your love. We pray these things in the precious name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to see you in the house of the Lord today where we do worship our Lord and Savior, the risen King Jesus. And he is glad that you are here today in his presence. He is glad that you're here today to worship him. I don't know how many of you have ever started on a journey and wondered, what am I in for? Why did I do this? Was I crazy? I mean, we go on those journeys sometimes, don't we? We get started and then we get this great amount of doubt in our heads. And we go, what was I thinking? Come on. You ever do that? Come on, be honest. I mean, we, we try to calculate things out, don't we? We say, well, if I do this, if I do this, if I do this, it should be okay. And we step out and we start going that, in that direction. Sometimes it's a task that we've taken on. And we're like, oh, why did I start this task? I have no idea how it's going to get accomplished. Or somebody asks us to do something with them and you're like, oh, man, I could have been doing something else. We run into those kind of things. I think those are kind of storms in our lives. We run into that perception of, why did I even think about doing this? There's other times that we may start on a journey and all of a sudden something around us goes awry. Now, you all know that we get a little bit of rain here in Florida. That's right. Come on. We're going down the highway and all of a sudden your wipers go from the intermittent to the... You can hardly see anything out there. And you're like, why? Why did I start? Why is it raining? Why is it? I can't see. And some of the people pull over the side of the road and their blinkers, they're, they're, you know, they're going like this, the hazard lights. You know they don't understand that somebody's going to come up behind them and hit them if they pull over the side of the road. You know, and then you're like, why? These are questions that, that we face all the time. Our gospel reading today and all of our readings are about having faith and having trust in the journey that we're on. I look at our reading in 1 Kings and poor Elijah, I mean he has been through a lot. Elijah has met with Ahab, he's taken the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel, he has shown them that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that the God that they worship is a false God. And Jezebel decides, yeah, I'm going to kill you. You are a target in my sights. And I'm going to kill you. By this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. And what does Elijah do? He runs. And he goes out into the wilderness. And can you imagine, why did I do that? God, why did you send me to Mount Carmel? Why did you send me? I mean, he revealed to everyone who God is. Why did you do that? And then God takes care of him, and he goes up into the cave in Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai area. And God speaks to him. But not in the earthquake, not like we would want to hear. Not in that deep voice. But he speaks to them in this low whisper and says, What are you doing here? And he says, my heart is for you, Lord. I'm zealous for you because people have rejected you. And God reminds them that there are 7,000 that are set aside that have that same heart and zeal not to lose heart. As we read in our gospel, Jesus is still among the 5,000 men and women and children that they've just fed. He tells the disciples, get in the boat and head over to the other side of the sea. 
and he starts dismissing the crowd. And when God dismisses us, it's not like dismissing, get out of my sight. Jesus is giving them the blessing. Jesus is blessing them as they go on their way. And then we hear about him going up onto the mountain and he's alone and he's praying. Have you ever wondered what he prayed? It doesn't say what he prayed. Thank you, Father, and finally got rid of all these people. I don't think so. I think Jesus is probably praying one for the disciples as they head off onto the next part of their mission, but also thanking the Father for feeding them, for showing His presence, for revealing who He is, so that others may have that hope. Giving thanks for what He's done and thanks for what He's about to do and praying for His disciples as they go away. The Gospel continues to say that they were battered by waves. It was evening and, you know, sometimes we, we get those afternoon storms, don't we? You look out onto the horizon and you see those clouds building up. Yesterday, Tilly and I did a garage sale. I love garage sales. I'm glad confession is a little later. But in the distance in the afternoon, we heard this boom. And you're like, oh no. We've got all this stuff out on the driveway and we're going to have to get it back in. So we closed everything down. Well, the same thing happens on the Sea of Galilee. It's down in this valley area and storms build up and they come rushing down into over the sea. And just like we get storms on the Indian River and we get storms here and there, these are what, this is what the disciples are facing, this huge storm. And they're being battered by the waves. But you know what? I don't think they were afraid of that. They're fishermen. Remember, Peter, James, John, and Andrew all were fishermen. They would have been out and used to that kind of weather, trying to batter it, trying to batten down the hatches, whatever it is. But they knew how to control their boats during that time. It was difficult, yes, because the wind was against them. They probably had to tack through everything so that they could make it through. They didn't have that good downwind run. They had to fight the waves. They had to go through all of that. And in the midst of that, just like you, when you're driving down the road and your wipers are going like this, it's hard to actually see, isn't it? You can't always see everything up ahead of you. And all of a sudden they see this aberration coming. And you see a mosaic thinking. And Jewish thinking. Hebraic thinking. The sea is dangerous. The sea is where there's evil. The sea is where things come up that can affect you and destroy you. There's only one who can control the sea. Does anybody know who can control the sea? Come on, it's a three-letter word, starts with a G. Thank you. And it's a big G, not a little G. Remember, the Israelites came up to this Red Sea. They were fleeing from Egypt. What could they do? Nothing. There was the perils. And what did God do? He parted the Red Sea. What happened when Paul was headed off to Rome? The sea came up. The waves came up. And he says, don't be afraid and threw, throw your stuff away. Not one of us is going to be killed. It's in Acts 27 if you're curious. And they threw all the cargo over. And the next thing you know, they were on shore in Malta. And not one had lost their lives. Jonah, how many remember the story of the big fish? All of a sudden, the waves came up. And he knew it was because he had gone away from God and what God had planned for him to do. It was the sea that scared them the most because this is where things can happen. There's stories of this Leviathan that God has created, this big serpent. How many of you ever think about the Loch Ness Monster? You ever hear about the Loch Ness Monster? You know, it's actually in Scripture. They call it a leviathan. A big monster of the sea. The sea monsters. 
people write about it all the time. Psalm 104, 25 through 26. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there. Living things, both small and great. There go the ships and the Leviathan that you formed. We look at those kind of things that are hindering us or that come to attack us that are not in our best interest. And so when the disciples see this aberration of Jesus coming towards them, they can't distinct who it is. And they're terrified. And they cry out, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. And then they cried out. They screamed. The Greek actually says they screamed or shrieked. You ever have somebody pop out around the corner and go, boo? I bet y'all did that as kids, didn't you? Or you're watching something on a movie or something and it just like pops out at you and you're like, whoa. They screech. They don't know what it is. They think it could be something evil. It could be something from the sea. The sea is boiling around them. And immediately, Jesus cries out, Take heart. Take courage. It is I. The Greek says... I am. Some of us should remember the I am statements. Moses, when he's going to the people of Israel to take them out, what does he say? He says, Lord, how will they know who I'm speaking of? And he says, tell them that I am who I am. And Jesus saying, take heart, I am. The same divine nature, I am. And then he says those famous three words, or four words do not be afraid if you use a contraction it's don't be afraid so it's three do not be afraid take heart take courage but even in all those circumstances and we have those circumstances in our lives don't we we have those storms in our lives. They may be emotional. They may be relational. They may be financial. They may be medical. They may be something. But we all have them. It could be the ministry that we're in and all of a sudden something seems to be not going right and you're wondering why. We have those storms in our lives. Peter calls out, Lord, if it is you, you see, even when Jesus speaks to him, he's not sure. Lord, if it is you, command me. Order me. Come out. Come out to you. And Jesus says what? One word. Come. Peter's eyes are focused on Jesus. The storm is still raging. The boat is still pitching. And yet he steps out. And he starts walking towards Jesus. In John Ortberg's book, if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. He writes this. He says, If I am going to experience a greater measure of God's power in my life, it will usually begin by acting in faith trusting God enough to take a step of obedience, simply acknowledging information about His power is not enough. You have to, or I, have to get my feet wet. If we're going to experience God's greater power, it begins first by trusting. Peter trusted when Jesus said, Come. Peter trusted to step out of the boat and start walking towards him. It's sometimes we get started that way. And then all of a sudden we see the things around us. And he felt the blustery wind and goes, What am I doing? He has that little bit of doubt. But you know what? He never lost his focus. Because once he realized that it's him that's doing this, he refocuses on Jesus. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. 
And Jesus looked at him and said, sink or swim, buddy. No, he didn't. Jesus reaches out and grabs his hand and walks with him back to the boat. And immediately when they got in, the waves ceased and all the others said, truly you are the Son of God because it is only God who controls the sea and he knows, they know who he is. You see, I think we're no different than the disciples. I think we're no different than Peter. I think we all have the same attitude. Lord, I want to step out of the boat and do something. And then once we get out there, we're like, what am I doing here? Rather than keeping our eyes focused, saying, Lord, help me. Help me. No matter what we're facing, sometimes we get that doubt in our minds and we forget and we need to just keep our eyes focused on who He is and what He can do. We allow fear to drop into our lives. Let me read you something about fear. This also came out of John Ortberg's book. But I think they're poignant thoughts for us. Living in fear keeps us from experiencing our God-given potential. What if Peter never stepped out of the boat? He wouldn't have experienced the power of God, recognizing his own limitation. Living in fear destroys our joy and robs us of life's delights. There are things in my life that sometimes I'm like, Oh, Lord, thank you for the joy. There are things that are purely joy in my life. They bring joy to my life. I'm not going to let fear destroy that. Living in fear destroys joy and robs us of life's delights. Living in fear causes us to focus on the negative. Living in fear creates a loss of intimacy between us and other people. We become afraid to say what we think or feel, afraid of the pain of conflict. Living in fear causes us to believe that God... Get this. Living in fear causes us to believe that God can't, won't, or take care of us. We lose sight of God's presence in our lives. We think, how can He do this for us? How can He be with us? God wouldn't do that for me. Living in fear, we separate ourselves of what God's power is. Living in fear, this one's precious. Living in fear limits our hopes, our dreams, and our calling. Peter recognized Jesus. He stepped out of the boat in confidence. The storms came up about him. And he put his focus back on Jesus and said, Lord, save me. We are called into ministry. We are called to be the light of the world. We are called to shine our light. We are called to share Jesus' joy. We are called to share the gospel. We are called to be at ministries. But are we afraid to step out of the boat or once we step out, we stop. Our fears take over rather than allowing God to work in us and through us and strengthen us. If you saw the overhead screen and the announcements, you know what BTC is now, Back to Church Sunday. It's about inviting somebody to church on September 21st. Not somebody that you bring on occasion, hey, why don't you come to church with me today? Invite somebody who hasn't been to church in a while. Invite somebody who hasn't even been to church because church is about community and it's about our relationships and it's about doing things together it's about family and that may be one of your fears that you'd be afraid to get out of the boat but God calls us all to get out of the boat I'll leave you with this thought from William Willimon something he said in one of his services, in his sermons. He put it this way. 
If Peter had not ventured forth, had not obeyed the call to walk on water, then Peter would never have had this opportunity for the recognition of Jesus and rescue by Jesus. I wonder if too many of us are merely splashing about in the safe shallows and therefore have too few opportunities to test and deepen our faith. You have to venture forth out on the sea. You have to prove his promises through trusting his promises through risk and venture. You see, if we just stay in our little comfort zone, we will never experience a deeper relationship and trust in God because we're relying on ourselves. It's when we venture out that we deepen our faith and our trust in God because his promises are true. What is God speaking to you today about stepping out of the boat? What is he placing in your heart about ministry or touching others? Are we laden with the fear? And if we are, can we say, Lord, save me, and then walk back to the boat with Jesus where the storms are calmed? Amen.